Good afternoon. It is good to be with you here again. And I want to thank Bishop Moses for allowing me to be a guest speaker here at the Great Commission Bible Conference in Kenya 2021. It is my privilege again to open up the Bible and listen to what God has to say to us. So please take your Bibles and open to Galatians chapter 5. In the book of Acts, we read these words. One day the Apostle Paul and Silas met a demon-possessed girl who was a fortune teller for her masters. In time, Paul turned and spoke to the demon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, he said. And instantly it left her. Her masters grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities. The whole city is in an uproar, uproar because of these Jews. Then the city officials ordered them to be stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten and then thrown into prison and into the inner dungeon where their feet were clamped in stocks. I want you to imagine how you would be feeling if you were Paul and Silas. You had gone and done a good work for the Lord and now were beaten, bleeding, bruised in a dark dungeon. What would you be doing? Listen to what Paul and Silas were doing. It says in Acts 16, 25, And around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Because of the coronavirus pandemic all around the world, many, many people have suffered greatly. I know many of you have suffered greatly and still are suffering greatly because of the pandemic. Some of you might be very stressed right now. Some of you may be very angry or bitter or worried right now. It would have been easy for Paul to be angry or bitter or worried in that prison. But instead of that, they were singing praises to God. How did they do that? The answer is because God didn't just come into the world to save our souls. God came into this world to also save our characters. Before you, in verse 22, is the list of the fruit of the Spirit. Read along with me as I read Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These words I just read are a description of God. If you sat down with God today, what would he be like? God says he would be like this. This is the description of what God is like. And better yet, this is also a description of what God is seeking to create in you and me. This is God's plan to form his character in us. Right now, we are going to look at God's word, at how to live in the fullness of God's joy and peace. You might be in very bad circumstances today. Is there a way for you to know joy and peace? Paul and Silas prove that we can know joy and peace in the very worst of circumstances. Could you enjoy knowing more joy and peace in your life today? God shows us how in his word. In other words, you do not need to be dominated by anger or bitterness 
or worry in a bad situation. In every situation, we can know God's joy and God's peace. We will begin by looking at the subject of God's joy, how to be filled with God's joy. And the first thing we need to do is understand a few things. Number one, what is the definition of joy? Understanding joy is not hard. It simply means to be glad. It says in Matthew 2.10, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And in Luke 2.10, The angel said to them, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. What were these people feeling? Gladness. That's what joy is. Gladness. Secondly, we need to know a second thing about joy, and that is joy is at the center of who God is. If you sat down and had lunch with God today, would he be joyful or sad or angry? God's very center is full of joy. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 says, You receive the word of God with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Whose joy? It was the Holy Spirit's joy that was inside these people. He's a joyful spirit. John 15.11 says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. And John 17, 13, these things I speak that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Jesus is glad and full of joy, and he wants you and me to be glad and full of his joy. Listen to Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Did you ever listen to a singer and their voice carried you away to heaven? Can you imagine what it will sound like when God sings and he sings over us with joy? A second thing we need to know about joy is that Joy is a central part of God. And that brings us to a third thing we need to know, and that is God commands us to be joyful. Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be glad. 1 Peter 4, 13, Keep on rejoicing. Philippians 3, 1, Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice always. Listen, God says that rejoicing is not an option for a Christian. We might say, she's a very nice Christian lady, but she complains a lot. Or, he's quite negative all the time. If that's a description of a Christian, something is very wrong. Because joy is supposed to be a central characteristic of the Christian, just as it is a central characteristic of God. God is full of joy, and he commands you and me to be full of joy. And certainly, there will be times of sorrow, just as Jesus sorrowed in the Garden of Gethsemane. But with the sorrow in the background will always be a sense of joy and peace as well. And joy and peace should be the characteristic qualities of our lives. Now, God commands us to be joyful. How do we obey that? You might be very unhappy today. How do you be joyful today? The key is found in verse 25. 
of this chapter. Look at verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. There are many, many verses in this passage that give lots of information, but there is only one command. That command is, keep in step with the Spirit. This is the key to being full of God's joy. Imagine a parent walking down a garden path with his child, and he reaches out his hand for the child to take, and the child puts his hand in his father's hand, and they walk down that path together. Right now, God is feeling joyful. Certainly, there are things in this world that make God mad and sad. But at the same time, God is full of joy over the things that are going right. And as he walks through this world, he holds out his hand to you and me. And he says, keep in step with me. Walk with me. And our job is to put our hand into his hand and walk with him, being joyful over the things that he is joyful with. God is inviting us to join him in being joyful over what makes him joyful. What type of things make God joyful? Number one, your salvation. Luke 10, 20 says, Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. God loves you and he died for you and he rejoices when you receive his son Jesus. Number two, the salvation of others. Luke 15, 10, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There are shouts of joy in heaven whenever someone gets saved. Number three, answered prayer. John 16, 24, Jesus says, Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be made full. God often answers prayers so that we might have joy, and it makes Him joyful. Then there are rewards for persecution. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and say, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Then there's hope in every situation. Romans 12.12 12 says, Be joyful in hope. When things are bad, we can tend to think that they will stay bad and there is no hope. But God promises that he works all things together for good to those who love God. And that means there's always hope because God will change things around. And then lastly, there is the Lord Jesus himself. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in who? Rejoice in the Lord Jesus. That we have a shepherd to guard our souls. That he is there to provide for us and protect us and lead us through life. That no matter what we're going through, we can look up and there is Jesus caring for us. Even as we suffer, he is there for us as our shepherd. And we are to rejoice about that. Listen, God does not command us to rejoice out of thin air. God calls us to rejoice with him over the things that he rejoices with. And what will that do for us? Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Fixing our thoughts on what makes God joyful will give you and me strength in this life. Thinking about the things that worry us and anger us will make us weak. Thinking about the things that are, 
our reasons for joy, our salvation, others' salvation, Jesus being with us, hope is always there for us, that will give us strength, God's strength inside our very souls. So how do we live full of God's joy? There are three steps. The second step is fix your thoughts on what makes God glad. Intentionally think about your salvation and other salvation, about answered prayer and rewards for persecution, for hope, and for Jesus Christ himself. And then number three, choose to be glad about them. Choose to be glad about them. Don't simply grind your teeth and say, I will now think about God giving us hope. I will now think about rewards for persecution. Allow yourself to feel the joy about those things. Think about the hope you have in the darkest situation, that Jesus is there to work all of that for good and respond emotionally with gladness about that. Think about your own salvation and the salvation of those you love and respond emotionally to that and be glad about it. In other words, take your thoughts from down here on your problems and put them up here on the things that make God glad. Yes, you have to deal with your problems, but don't fix your thoughts on your problems. Fix your thoughts on the things above, on the things of God. That brings us to the first step on how to live in the fullness of joy. And that is, kill all joy stealers. Kill all joy stealers. Listen, focusing on what's going wrong creates joy stealers. Focusing on wrong circumstances creates complaining, which we know God hates. Focusing upon wrong people creates bitterness and unforgiveness. Focusing on the wrong future and how bad it might be creates the joy stealer of worry and fear. These joy stealers will cause us to not live or know the joy and gladness of God. Instead, we must kill all joy stealers. And again, That does not mean we don't deal with our problems. We must deal with them. We just don't focus or fix our thoughts on them. So maybe your health is bad. You're not feeling good. How do you experience God's joy? Number one, as you deal with your problem by taking care of yourself, maybe seeing a doctor, asking for prayer, Number one, kill joy stealers of complaining and being negative. Number two, discipline yourself to fix your thoughts on what is going right, on your salvation, on your home in heaven. Number three, choose to be glad about it. Choose to be glad about heaven and how God is there for you. Maybe someone has been cruel to you in life. How do you experience joy in that? Number one, as you deal with problems, as you pray about it, as you ask others for counsel, as you maybe speak to the person who's causing problems, number one, kill all joy stealers, specifically bitterness and unforgiveness. Number two, discipline your thoughts on Jesus forgiving you for all that you have done when you didn't act right. And number three, choose to be joyful and glad about that. Maybe your future looks dark because you don't have much money. Number one, as you deal with the situation, working hard, praying hard, asking for counsel, kill all joy stealers, specifically worry 
and fear. Number two, discipline yourself to think on God's promises that He is your shepherd to guide you, guard you, lead you. And number three, choose to be glad about that with great joy. Is this easy to do? No. This is some of the hardest things we will ever do. But that is what it takes to know God's joy. The easy path is to worry and complain and to be bitter about what's going on. The joyful path is harder, but it's a great reward. It all hinges on what you do with your thoughts. So much of this depends on your thoughts, not your circumstances. Paul and Silas prove that your circumstances can be very bad, but if you put your thoughts in the right place, you can know joy anyway. And that's what this is calling us to do. It's as simple as this. Fix your thoughts on what's going bad, and you will feel bad. Fix your thoughts on what's going right, and you will feel joyful. It's really that simple. I know a person who continuously listens to a radio program that's always talking about how bad the economy is, how bad the future is going to be. What do you think are the emotions that person has? They are negative, they are scared, they are worried. And it's all because they continually think about how bad things are going to be. If you fix your thoughts on bad circumstances, bad people, bad future, you will feel bad. You will not be a joyful Christian. That's why God says to set our minds on the things above to set our minds on the things that makes God glad. He commands us to think about the things that make him glad and then be glad ourselves. Do you want to live a life of joy? Then you must practice these three steps. Yes, deal with your problems, but set your mind on the things that make God glad. So what decides if you're going to be joyful or not? It's not your circumstances. It is your thinking. Paul and Silas thought about the things above, and so they experienced joy from above. And that's what you need and I need to do to be full of God's joy. Now, that is how to be full of joy. What about being full of God's peace. Right before we get into that, how about if we just take a one minute break and stand up and stretch and get ready to find out how God says to have peace. So take a break for right now. All right, welcome back from your break. Now we're going to look at how to have God's peace in your life. Could you stand to know peace today? God does too. He wants you to have his peace in you. Let's look at what we need to know first. Number one, the definition of peace. How would you define peace? The dictionary says a state of being quiet. Uh, the people of Ecuador call peace sitting down in your heart. The people of South America call peace a quiet heart. But when we look at the Hebrew word for peace, which is shalom, it means far more than having quietness. It means having power for well-being. Power for well-being, for being strong, for being healthy, for being whole, for being complete. Listen, God's peace is not the absence of trouble. 
It is power for well-being even in the midst of trouble. If you had it as a picture, it is the picture of a strong man standing over your life, making sure that you're safe. God's peace is power to bring well-being and wholeness and completeness to your life. Where does peace come from? Number two, the source of peace is found in God. John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The disciples were troubled and fearful because Jesus was going away. How would they make it? They would make it because Jesus was leaving behind a gift. The gift was his peace, his power for well-being. And that teaches us an important point. In order to have God's peace, you have to go to the source, God himself. Romans 15.33, the God of peace. Romans 16.20, the God of peace. Philippians 4.9, the God of peace. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the God of peace. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, the Lord of peace. Hebrews 13.20, the God of peace. Do we get the idea? There is a source to go to for the peace that you are seeking. It is God. He is the God of peace. Although Jesus says that the world does give a kind of peace. In the world, there are things that can feel peaceful and give a temporary type of peace. When you have plenty of money, when you have good health, when you have lots of good friends, that can create a kind of peace in your life. But what happens when your money is gone or your health is gone? or your friends are gone, that peace leaves. But God's powerful, well-being peace will still be there when your money and your health and your friends are gone. That's why it is such a special gift. Sadly, many people in this world, when their peace is gone, choose alternatives to help them to escape their pain. Choose alcohol and drugs and affairs in order to be able to find peace. But they'll never find lasting peace apart from God's peace. The problem is there's no lasting peace here on earth. It is only found in Jesus. But look what Jesus says in these verses. He offers us his peace. John 14, 27. My peace I give to you. Jesus offers us his peace as a gift. Would you like that gift today? Would you like power for well-being to stand over your life and guard it? That means we must accept his peace. Here is an important truth. You cannot know the peace of God without first making peace with God. You cannot have the peace of God without first making peace with God. There is a verse in Romans that tells us about the trouble we are all in. Romans 1.18, the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of men. God tells us that our sins have destroyed our peace with God, that God must punish us for what we have done, and that there's no way that we can do something to escape his anger. That means all of us are in trouble. 
But that's where our King Jesus Christ came. And he stepped down from heaven and stepped up to the cross and was nailed there and died as a substitute to pay for our crimes. And then he rose from the dead and offers the world the gift of peace with God. And who gets that peace? All who come to Jesus and place their faith in him as Lord and King. What is the way to have the fullness of God's peace? Number one, you must receive Jesus as your peacemaker. Have you made peace with God through putting your faith in Jesus as your King and Lord? You cannot have the peace of God until you make peace with God through Jesus Christ. But once you commit yourself to Christ, number two, you keep in step with walking with the Holy Spirit. Do you see the same key for being full of joy is also true for being full of peace. God the Holy Spirit holds out his hand to you and says, walk with me. And then we have a choice to go our own way or to put our hand in his hand and walk with him through life. Philippians 4 gives us four steps in having God's peace. You're going to want to write these down. Four steps to having God's peace. Look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look here at the first step for having God's peace. Number one, pray for God's control. Verse 6 says, present your requests to God. What is the natural thing that we do when we have troubles? The natural thing is to worry. And very often the last thing we think to do is to pray. God says, start by praying. When Jesus came into Jerusalem as king, the disciples had a donkey with them and they had a cloak in their arms. And it says that when Jesus was ready to ride the donkey, they took that cloak and they threw it over the donkey's back. God tells you and me, he wants to take all our burdens and throw it upon his shoulders so that we don't carry them anymore. One of the problems of why we worry is we put on our shoulders what is supposed to be on Jesus' shoulders. God tells us, cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. Isn't that ignoring our problems? No. That is putting the problems off me and onto Jesus. He can bear them. He says, pray to me and cast your burdens upon me. Think about a worry that you have. Have you prayed to God to take that away from you and to solve the problem? The book of James says, we have not because we ask not. And sometimes God is not giving peace because we're not asking for it. But we need to say, Father, take my health problems. Father, take my relationship problems. Father, take my money problems and pray for God to control the situation. The first step is to pray for God's control. The second step is found in two words in verse 6, two words that are often overlooked. 
It says, in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving. The second step to having peace is to thank for God's controlling. First, pray for God's control. Second, thank for God's controlling. How often do we pray to God to take something and then afterwards walk away worrying? God says, I want you to pray for my control and immediately thank me for my control. God says, I want you to expect a yes answer when you ask me to take control of a situation. James 1, 6 through 7 says, When he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. God says if you ask for it, you're supposed to expect a yes answer. If you don't expect a yes answer, don't expect to get an answer. This means as you pray for your health problem, you say, thank you, Lord, that you're taking control of that health problem. As you pray for your money problem or your relationship problem, you then say, thank you, Lord, that you're releasing your control over these problems. Pray for it and then thank God for it. That's what he says to do. Think about a worry that you have. Have you prayed for God to control it? Then have you thanked God for controlling it? Even if you don't see it, thank Him. Pray with thanksgiving. Then the third step is in verse, the next verse. Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. The third step for having God's peace is fix your thoughts on God's blessings. Does that sound familiar? The same key for having God's joy is found in having God's peace. You must take responsibility for what you think. God says, get on your knees and pray for him to control things, then thank God for taking control of those things, and then fix your thoughts on God's blessings, not your problems. Yes, you have to deal with problems, but don't fix your thinking on the problems. In every bad situation, there is always something going right. Think about those things. God says, think about the things that are true and noble and right and pure. The things that are lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. This is the way to know peace. It has to do with your thinking, not so much your circumstances. It has to do with your thinking. Then one last step. Obey God's commands. The next verse, Philippians 4, 9 says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Peace comes from what you think, but also what you do. What if you are openly disobeying God in an area of your life? What if you are openly complaining about your pains? What if you are openly unforgiving to someone who hurt you? What if you are openly worrying about the future? Then God is going to send you a guilty conscience to make you feel bad so that you will turn from that sin. And if you don't turn from that sin, he will send even more discipline as a loving father to get you to turn away. At those times of disobeying, are you going to feel peace? No. The answer to feeling peace is to commit yourself to obeying God. 
If you have areas of open disobedience in your life, you will never know the strong power of God's peace in your life. We all want peace, but often we rob ourselves of peace through disobedience. To know God's peace, we must kill all disobedience. Then obey God with everything we know to do. Praying for God's control is obedience. Thanking for God's control is obedience. Fixing your thoughts on God's blessing is obedience. And once you do that, what does God say that you will know? Look at verse 9, the last sentence. And the God of peace will be with you. These are God's steps for how to be filled with his peace. So let's go back to the beginning. Paul and Silas are in the worst situation, in pain, in the dark, wondering what's going to happen next, and yet they are filled with peace and joy. How did they do that? Because God the Holy Spirit was right there with them, extending his hand, and they put their hand into his hand. And that's how they could know. The key to being full of peace and joy is keeping in step with God the Holy Spirit. To be joyful, let's review. Paul and Silas had to kill all joy stealers as they sat in that cell. Then fix their thoughts on what God is glad about and then choose to be glad about them. And they were so glad they began singing about them. They didn't give in to complaining. They didn't give in to unforgiveness and bitterness. They didn't give in to worry and fear, but instead put their thoughts on the things that made God glad and were glad themselves. And then how did they have God's peace? Number one, they prayed for God's control. They thanked God for taking control, they fixed their thoughts on God's blessings, and they obeyed God's commands in every way they knew. That is how they could sing in that dark dungeon while they were in pain. And it wasn't because their circumstances were good. It was because they put their thoughts on what was good. And that is what will change for you and me too. Think about a trouble that you're having. Which of these steps do you need to practice? Do you need to ask God to forgive you of anything? Do you need to commit yourself to anything? Whatever God is prompting you to do, give in and say yes. He is holding out his hand to you and says, walk with me. Put your hand into his hand and know the fullness of his peace and joy. Thank you, and may God bless you.